Good morning, everybody. We uh, are going to give it just a few minutes here so that everybody can roll in. We will probably start just a couple minutes after 1030 uh, once it looks like we have everybody in here. But uh, thank you for joining this morning. We're uh, looking forward to it. Right, we've had another block of people join. So um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're gonna give it just a few more minutes here, uh, maybe around 10.32, 10.35, and then we will get going.
All right, good morning again, everybody. We're gonna give it just a couple more minutes as some last folks trickle in here and then we will get started shortly. All right, I think we are just about ready to get started here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just want to go over a couple details here and uh, say hello, and then we will introduce our speaker, Daniel Dye. So I am Sam Pass. I am the pest control and nursery greenhouse market manager for FMC Professional Solutions. Uh, and this is our September edition of our first Friday webinar series. Uh, and we are lucky today to have industry legend Daniel Dye on with us as our first guest speaker this month. So appreciate everybody joining to see uh, us and to see Daniel. Uh, I'll give a little bit more of background on Daniel here in just a second, uh, but do want to say a couple things for FMC first. Uh, one, we really appreciate you joining. Uh, these first Friday webinars have been a great part of our year this year, and we've really enjoyed offering this to you. Uh, another great initiative we have going this year is our Towstar 25th anniversary celebration. So as part of our uh, celebration of 25 years of registration for our Towstar brand, uh, we are running a huge sweepstakes uh, where we're giving away some great prizes, including a couple of Ford F-150 trucks, uh, we are in the last 20 days of our sweepstakes here, uh, but everyone is still welcome to sign up and enter. Uh, you just need to visit towstar25th.com, and I am putting that link uh, in the chat right now. We'll send it out again later, but uh, towstar25th.com. So uh, before we get going here, uh, I will hand it over to uh, Ed Damask to give just a few details about continuing education units for those of you interested in those this morning. Ed, do you want Thanks, to- Thanks, uh, Sam. Go ahead? Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, again, this is our eighth webinar this year. So I just want to reiterate Sam's thank you for your attendance. We've had probably thousands of PMPs throughout this year. It's been a, a wonderful uh, program. Um, Next month, so you can plan ahead. This is typically on the first Friday of each month. Uh, but next month, we're going to have a social media digital marketing uh, kind of a business special uh, for you. And we're going to do that on October 8th. So if you want to put that down, um, we're pushing it back a week. October 8th, social media and digital marketing. Um, the states for today's webinar that we're approved in, uh, I'm just going to rattle them off real quickly, Arizona, District of Columbia, Florida, Hawaii, Indiana, Maryland, Michigan, Montana, 
New Mexico, Oregon, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Utah, Washington, and West Virginia. Those are the states where we're currently approved to offer CEU credits. Uh, we'll send you an email with any details that uh, explains what you have to do, if anything, to obtain your CEUs. Otherwise, we'll let you know that we're pretty much handling the paperwork ourselves. Um, you'll receive a certificate of attendance after the fact, um, and, and that's how we take care of the CEUs. During Dan's presentation, there's a couple of things. He's going to have two pauses uh, about a third of the way and two thirds of the way through with a keyword. This is to make sure that you're, you're not watching uh, Sports Center. <laughs> so we need you to type in the keyword that he's going to give you on the screen and we're going to type it into the chat box. And that lets the states know that you're actively participating in this webinar. Right after his presentation, we're going to give you a quiz. We'll put a link in the chat box. That takes about three minutes, very simple, about 10 questions. Uh, same thing, it lets the states know that you're actually actively participating. And that's part of the CEU process. Last thing, in the chat, um, you, you know, uh, continue to, to chat with us there, but if you have questions that you want answered throughout the webinar, sometimes we have breaks like that, uh, keyword moment or we will have a Q&A after the fact, feel free to put as many questions as you want to in the Q&A section. Uh, that's it for me. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan on cockroaches and silverfish. All right. I would be doing a, a disservice to everybody here if I didn't give a little quick oh, background sorry. on Dan. So uh, Daniel is an associate certified entomologist emeritus with 44 years of pest management experience. He's also served on the board of directors for the Florida Pest Management Association. Uh, and although Daniel's main expertise is in urban entomology, he has a keen interest in other insects, spiders, creepy critters found in the wild places. We're not chasing spiders and insects. Daniel and his wife, Yvonne, search for herpetofauna, reptiles and amphibians to photograph. Uh, and I'm sure Daniel will share some of his great photography with you today, but uh, really is a special photographer as well as a special entomologist. So Daniel, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you to take it away. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a, quite an honor to be able to sit here and, um, and, and speak all to, uh, to these technicians uh, through, through you guys at FMC. So uh, I hope, we, uh, hope everybody has their pen and notebook ready because um, we're ready to get this thing going. And, uh, what I, my title is cockroaches and silverfish and gotta love them. Well, you know, we know uh, we love them because that, that keeps us uh, in, uh, in, in food and good things like televisions and cars and all that. That's how we make our money. But our customers don't like them too much. So that's where we come in. So let's go ahead and get this thing going. Whoops, it's not advancing for some reason, hold on. There we go. I guess I'm going to have to hit my mouse instead. Here's something to consider. Now, um, I, I start off most of my PowerPoints with this. Uh, the key to controlling any pest is knowing all you can about that pest. And that's extremely important because any of us can grab a B&G or some bait or, or granules or whatever and apply the product. But uh, knowing why you're applying the product and knowing a little bit about the biology and habits of the uh, insects that you're dealing with is important because then you know pretty much where to apply the product and about how much you're going to have to do and or, or uh, to apply um, and for no pest you have to no pest so i highly highly recommend that you uh, study the uh, the pests in your area that you're dealing with whether it's roaches or ants or spiders uh, silverfish uh, it, it, it doesn't matter you need to know all you can. Now, this is this is not a shameless plug, but I do want to uh, talk talk to y'all about this book right here. I don't know if you can see it. It's the new uh, PCT book that just came out uh, with uh, Stoy Hedges as the author, and it's it's the new cockroach structural uh, cockroach book, and I highly recommend it. It has a lot of good things in there. Some of the things, of course, I can't cover 
in uh, in 45 to 50 minutes. So I, I highly recommend that you all get this book. It's brand new, just came out. So uh, uh, consider that. Anyway, let's look at this guy right here. Actually, it's not a guy, it's a gal. Uh, you can look at it real close. I bet many of you are thinking right now, well, that has got to be a German cockroach. Well, I'm telling you, it's not. It is an Asian cockroach. Now, look at it closely. You notice that it has the same bars on the pronotum as a, as a, a German cockroach does. But when you look at the wing, and back here you can see the otheca, and uh, the wing actually covers uh, a portion of the otheca. On a German cockroach, which I'll show you late, later, the wing does not cover the otheca. It actually, the otheca actually extends uh, further out on a German cockroach. The other thing, let's put up another picture here. This is a, another Asian. You can see uh, the egg sac right here. And if you notice, the wing is quite elongated and you can see the Circe right here and here. So that's pretty much where the, uh, the egg sac, the otheca starts. Now, the other things that you can do as far as uh, to tell the difference between a German and an Asian cockroach is um, Germans rarely fly. Uh, uh, let's say barely fly. Uh, they may flutter if you, you know, flip them off a counter or something like that, but they don't fly like these, these Asian cockroaches do. They'll actually uh, fly you know, 100 feet without a problem at all. Uh, the, how they got started in... Um, in the US was down around Polk County, Florida back in the 80s. And um, I was active, I actually had my own company in Tampa at the time, it was called Shield Termite and Pest Control. And uh, they were actually gathering on, I would say the west side of homes in great numbers. And uh, you know, it, it surprised everybody because everybody at first thought that German roaches have somehow adopted uh, you know, a way to live outdoors in great numbers. Well, that wasn't true. So uh, you know, they, they started researching these things and uh, found out that it was the same genus, but a different species. Now, if you look at this thing right here, you'll notice there, there's Daniel D. Dye, Shield Termite and Pest Control. Uh, my training at Van Waters and Rogers at the time, and uh, it's they changed it to Univar. Now they have a different name. I uh, don't even know what it is right at this point. But I did one and a half hours of intensive study uh, for Asian cockroaches. So, and this was August 11th, 1986. So that was some time ago. Now, the reason why I'm putting this up here, so this shows you that I'm an expert, I guess, in uh, Asian cockroaches, but I can tell you <laughs> I'm not, because uh, the stuff that we were taught there, you know, was a little different than what actually came to be uh, with these roaches. Uh, they were, uh, had a fear of them, uh, you know, breeding with the, uh, with the German cockroaches. And uh, there we have a, a roach on the outside and the inside that, uh, you know, would, would fly and be in great numbers and all that kind of stuff. But that never came. They, they didn't breed together as far as I know. I don't, I don't think there's any research out there that even proves it. But I, I say that mainly because things do change as research goes on year after year, we find out different things about some of the pests that we're dealing with. You can see it with bed bugs and, uh, you know, we have that, that, uh, that hornet now out in uh, Washington state. As we study them, things are gonna, uh, you know, tell you uh, things that we can do to help control them. It, it's just, research is important and is important is what I'm trying to tell you. Now, uh, also this roach does fly and they'll fly towards the house uh, because there's reflective light at the house in the evening or at nighttime. When I noticed, noticed them here at the farm was uh, when I first moved here, I had them in pretty great numbers just north of Gainesville, Florida. And um, they would fly towards anything that light was reflecting off of. They wouldn't, uh, would not fly directly to the light, but they would fly to the reflecting surface. And, and sometimes pretty good numbers. 
but I, I got to tell you that uh, the numbers were high back then. Now, I'm not one to treat my yard often at all. I have treated it, but uh, it was for other uh, reasons, not for the uh, Asian cockroach. But the population here has dropped. I rarely see any now. So sometimes nature has a way of balancing things out uh, with, without our help. So, uh, you know, one year you'll have a, a spike in a certain pest and the next year you won't. So it's, it's just the way nature, you know, it's, it's cyclical is what I'm trying to tell you. So anyway, that's pretty much it with, um, with Asian cockroaches. If you do have a, an issue, a bad issue, uh, especially in the Southeast, I'm not, not sure how far North they've managed to get, but they are throughout Florida and the Gulf states, especially uh, uh, in the Southern parts of uh, these states like Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and then maybe around uh, Texas area, and Texas has another one uh, called the uh, Vega. It's a field cockroach that looks like uh, this roach as well, same genus. So anyway, uh, treat it with uh, a synthetic pyrethroid of your choice. Towstar is a good uh, choice for those, and, um, and it does a pretty good job. There's also baits that you can put out for these roaches as well. So let's uh, move on to the next subject. Now that's the uh, German cockroach that I was telling you about. And if you notice the, uh, the Otheca here extends well past uh, the wings. So that's one way you can tell the difference. So if you have uh, you know, a roach that comes in and has the Otheca on it and the wings go beyond it, it came in from the outside. But it's obvious here that this is definitely a German cockroach. And uh, here's a, another photograph of a female. And you notice that the wings do go past, you know, the abdomen, but there's no, there's no uh, egg sac, you know, connected here, the Otheca in this case. And there's your uh, male um, German cockroach. Now I'm gonna get a little bit into the treatment of cockroaches. I am a firm believer in baits when it comes to German cockroaches especially uh, in residential homes, uh, because, uh, you know, baits, you know, attract the roach to them. So let's, let's talk a little bit about it. There's your male cockroach. How to apply cockroach gel baits correctly. Now, this is proven. We did it this way, you know, for many, many years. I was the training coordinator at uh, Florida Pest Control uh, here at the corporate office in Gainesville. And we did research, of course, uh, following the label and stuff. And we found out that when you apply several BB size, you know, applications in, in the areas that uh, these uh, roaches were found, uh, it was quite effective. I mean, it did a good job. Now, these, these uh, BB size should be placed in cracks and crevices. Too many times I go to a home uh, that has been treated for uh, German cockroaches and the, the bait is exposed. You can, you can actually see it, you know, in different areas. Uh, it, it, that's not the way you apply these baits. They must be in cracks and crevices. And the reason why, if you, if you have a female that is actually gravid, has the egg sac, she is not going to move very much. In other words, if you put the baits uh, in an area that is away from where she's at, outside of cracks and crevices, she's not gonna feed on it. So you have to put those, that, that, that bait deep in the, those cracks and crevices, then she's able to just move a few inches and, uh, and get the bait. So for heavy applications or heavy infestations, you apply two spots per, uh, per linear foot. And uh, you know, part, of, part of this is missing for some reason, I can't see beyond here. Let's see if I can move this over. Yeah, there we go. I don't need to see myself. Oh, it popped back. Let me see. Stay. Ah, I guess it's not going to do it. I'll move it down. Yeah, that, that works. Anyway, it's one spot for every six inches. And uh, that's for heavy infestations. Remember, they're BB size applications. And once again, it doesn't there. Now we got it. For light to moderate infestations, it's uh, one spot per two linear feet. And, uh, and that's usually enough. Now, you can gauge this yourself. Uh, this is just a guideline I'm giving you here. So um, when you go to the, to the, uh, uh, the house, the, the residence that has a high 
you know, that has German roaches, you have to decide, you know, how much bait uh, to put out. And I got to tell you that if you don't put enough bait out to knock the population back, you're, 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 you're asking for trouble. Always put enough bait out. Matter of fact, over bait if you have to. Um, one spot application should be about an eighth of an inch in diameter. Now, the reason why I say put enough out, because when you have German cockroaches that um, basically maybe not uh, fed enough or you have some that live through it, that's when you start getting this beta version that people talk about. So you want to knock out as many as you possibly can and then go back again, uh, maybe in a few weeks and see how you did. So now, OK, let me move this up. <laughs> this is funny. I got this thing right here in my way. So uh, cockroach gel baits can be applied as crack and crevice treatment in or near harbage areas as the label allows. Now you guys have heard about the, um, the uh, thing that Dean Miller has talked about, the little uh, uh, cockroach uh, tacos, uh, and they're very effective. They do a good job, but remember, uh, those need to be put out of sight and out of mind as well. It's, it's no different. You just don't fill uh, the, the wax paper with bait and just, you know, put it nonchalantly uh, in different uh, locations where people can see them. Make sure you apply those things out of sight and out of mind as well. Here we go. Hold on a minute. There. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, like I said, in cracks and crevices, uh, places you want to uh, target would be uh, in and around cabinets. Um, of course, go under equipment, behind equipment, um, definitely uh, within or near garbage collection areas, you know, put that stuff in there where the roaches are hanging out. Uh, and sometimes these roaches get a little bit out of hand where they're actually overflowing from the kitchen and bathrooms into, into living areas. And they're going to hide in the cracks and crevices as well. So you want to place them along the walls or floors in cracks and crevices, baseboards, stuff like that. Make sure you, you apply the, that, that bait inside uh, the crack and crevice. And uh, when it comes to furniture, uh, such as tables and such, make sure that you can find spots, uh, cracks, crevices, um, uh, screw holes, you know, where the, uh, the bolt is recessed a little bit you can go ahead and apply that bait in there as well. So, you know, you, you, you kind of like use your, uh, uh, your, your training to, um, and your knowledge to know where to uh, apply these cracks and crevices to control these German roaches. Also, um, um, the male German roach can, you know, she, he basically mates with as many uh, females as he possibly can. So uh, <laughs> you want to make sure that uh, you, you, you get those out of control as well, because they will, you know, uh, mate and continue to mate until it finally dies, you know, sort of like humans, you know, we finally die eventually, no longer mate. So always think crack and crevices. This is where the roaches hang out. So that's something to definitely remember when it comes to uh, controlling these the German roaches. Okay, now let me uh, get on my high horse about uh, gel baits versus re residual um, for crack and crevice uh, products and such as that. Now, this is uh, something that I want you to consider. Uh, I have no problem with liquids, They're, no doubt about it. They, they do a good job and they have a place. But when it comes to German roaches, this is something that I have found out over years of research using baits, that um, baits are usually in residential homes now more effective in the long run than going in there and chasing them around with uh, some liquid application. Uh, it's the out of sight. It doesn't chase them out. It leaves the roaches where they belong. So let's get into this. Uh, properly applied gel baits uh, in cracks and crevices is where you want to put them. Um, now, sprays will often disperse the roaches. In other words, the customers start seeing more roaches crawling around because you've actually applied a liquid and of course they don't wanna get wet. So they, they, they run out and the, the, uh, the customer sees more. So, you know, they, they disperse them. The 
uh, it, this is one of my favorite. Remember this, sprays, chase, baits, attract. And uh, what I mean by chasing, it doesn't really chase, but when you apply a liquid, you're going to disperse them. The baits, when you apply them, they are going to attract the roach to that area. Now, uh, some of the cockroach baits that are out there, you guys are, you have so many baits to deal, uh, to choose from, and they're all good. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but the trick is to uh, uh, keep a rotation going. Uh, don't use the same bait over and over and over again. If you have a job and you find that the bait is not working uh, properly, then that, that population has built up, a, you know, some type of uh, uh, aversion to that bait. So uh, uh, make sure that you do rotate your bait. Now, some of these baits have a secondary kill. In other words, um, when a roach eats the bait and dies, you know, roaches are cannibalistic. They will eat each other and they'll eat the fecal droppings and such as that as well. So you get that uh, uh, secondary kill, which is important. So uh, uh, it depends on the manufacturer of the bait. Not all of them have that secondary kill, but uh, several of them do. And um, of course, um, most residuals uh, sprays do not have that secondary kill. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead. All righty. Uh, with the jail baits, when feeding will often kill the roach. Uh, with uh, residual sprays, um, a lot of the roaches, uh, you have to have uh, what you call exposure time. In other words, the roach has to be on that product for a period of time to get a, a good a dose uh, that will actually kill them. So um, just the casual walkover on some of the products, especially as the product starts to weaken, uh, a lot of times they will not, um, you know, it, they won't die, you know, and that's how you get, you start getting, um, you know, resistance to certain uh, products as well, because it doesn't kill them. And then they mate, and the next group is a little bit more resistant and so on and so on and so on. So if baits are applied correctly, the result is, uh, is pretty good. And in many cases, with my experience, I have collapsed pretty good size uh, German cockroach populations uh, within a month with no problem at all. And with very few roaches being seen because uh, they're out, uh, you know, they're not out crawling around as much as when you ply uh, a liquid. So it's a win-win for both you and your customer. So keep that in mind. So let's, uh, that's it for the, uh, the, the uh, German cockroaches so, uh, and the Asians. So let's look at this one right here. Uh, there's a good chance that most of you have never even seen this one. Uh, this, this cockroach is thought to be from, uh, from uh, Africa and, uh, or Northern Africa or somewhere in there and uh, traveled over here into the Mediterranean many, many years ago. And we first started seeing this roach in Miami. I think it was in 1903, somewhere around there, if, I, if my memory is working right. Now, this is what we call the uh, brown banded cockroach. Uh, this cockroach is different from uh, the German cockroaches, mainly because uh, they just don't uh, infest kitchens and bathrooms. Uh, as the German roach does. Now, if the German roach population is high, uh, then of course, you know, they have no place to hide and all that. They'll go to uh, um, out into the living areas and into bedrooms and to dresser drawers and all that. But this roach here automatically can be found anywhere in the house, anywhere in the house. This, this roach used to be a major problem many, many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, and I think it's basically because uh, we don't see them as much now is because uh, of most houses are air conditioned. You know, they have uh, uh, central air uh, for the summer. And of course they have the heat uh, for the winter time. And so the air is conditioned, humidity is not as, as high. Um, it's just, and uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the habitat uh, is not as, as comfortable or suitable for uh, the brown banded uh, roach as it used to be. This roach at one time was a major problem in Hawaii. 
and uh, it actually had larger populations in Hawaii than our German cockroach did. But over the years, things have changed. You don't see these very often anymore, and uh, which is a good thing. But if you do run across an infestation of, uh, um, of brown-banded cockroaches, the treatment is the same uh, with baits. Um, apply your baits in cracks and crevices, similar to what you would do with, um, with German cockroaches. Now you're looking at a female here. Notice that the, uh, the wings do not extend very far. She is almost flightless. Uh, she may be able to flutter, but uh, not go very far at all. And here's one uh, female with her, uh, her uh, egg sac, her Othica connected uh, still, and she's gonna go drop it somewhere. Um, oh, by the way, the German cockroaches will hold that Othica until uh, it's almost ready to hatch and then she'll deposit it somewhere suitable. And uh, these things will deposit their egg sacs a lot of times up high uh, around picture frames, behind picture frames and stuff like that. But they like to, for some reason, uh, uh, deposit their egg sacs higher than a German cockroach. German cockroach would normally just stick it in a corner somewhere under a you know, refrigerator or stove, uh, similar to that. Now this is the male. Notice the, the male is quite skinny. Uh, the wings are very long. They actually fly. And um, that's just the way nature is. The, the female kind of hangs out in a certain area and, and, and moves around that way. Uh, the males will fly so uh, they can readily get to the females to mate. So there's your male uh, brown banded cockroach. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys have, have had the experience with these. Um, in my 44 years, I've only seen them once in Tampa, and that was back in the 70s. So, you know, they're, they're not common at all, but I sometimes hear about them popping up uh, here and there. Now, this came, these came from the, uh, the lab at uh, UF, uh, Dr. Kaler. Uh, he was, was nice enough to allow me to uh, collect some out of their uh, their breeding collection and uh, bring them here and photograph them. And so uh, that's how I got these. It wasn't from um, a customer. Okay, there's uh, the code time. Can't hear you, Ed. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yeah, just reiterating what everybody's doing to make sure you're putting September in the chat box, but they're doing a great job of it this month. Excellent, excellent. So you want me to keep on? Uh, yeah, why don't you keep going on? You know, everybody keep putting your questions into that Q&A box, just another reminder. Okay, looks like I have something about another half hour or so left, I believe. Am I on pretty well on schedule, Ed? Yeah, yes, you're halfway through. Very good, thank you. I'll go ahead and sure. keep on then. Okay, now uh, this one here, I'm sure you guys have uh, seen before because this, this is probably the most widespread uh, other than maybe the German cockroaches uh, uh, here in the Americas. And then this is what we call an American cockroach. This is a female. Um, she hasn't dropped her egg sac. Now, these, will, these roaches will deposit their Othica, you know, on blocks and crevices of, uh, of blocks. And a lot of times they'll actually uh, camouflage it by chewing uh, whatever is there and, and, and attaching it to the... Uh, to the Othica where you can't see it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I've witnessed it many times. And, and a lot of times they will drop their egg sacs um, in cracks and crevices, wall voids and stuff like that as well. I have seen their egg sacs, you know, in different locations. So, uh, but yeah, that's the female. And one way you can tell the American cockroach from uh, other paradomestic roaches is uh, the pronotum right here. You notice that it has this, uh, I, I call it a bat emblem, you know, with the wings spread. 
uh, and, you, and it's very, this part is dark and then this gets a little lighter here. And that's one way you can tell the difference between these, uh, the Australian, uh, you know, the Oriental and such. And uh, we'll be talking about all of those, by the way. But um, that's, that's how you can tell them. It's, it's dark and then a little lighter here. And that's, that's probably the, the way I would, uh, uh, you know, ID them. Now, the uh, American cockroaches, their habitat is completely different from the brown and the Australian in a way that, uh, you know, those usually are up a little bit higher, but these guys like to stay down low and they love sewers. Uh, they love sewers like crazy. Now, uh, a few years ago, when I was still uh, working, uh, across the hall from my, uh, my office, there were two bathrooms. And on occasion, we would see American cockroaches and we would also see these things called ensign wasp and uh, ensign wasp uh, are uh, parasitoids. They, uh, they actually lay their eggs on the ootheca, the egg sac, and, and then uh, the, the larva actually feeds on the roaches within the, uh, the egg sac itself. So anyway, we would see those, but uh, the, one of the toilets started overflowing. The wax seal um, was, was not you know, properly, uh, it wasn't working properly. And we're thinking, you know, after we, we figured it out that that's the, the area the German roaches were coming. I mean, the American roaches were coming up. We had a plumber come in there to lift the toilet and replace the seal. And I'm in my office and all of a sudden I hear this, this, uh, this scream <laughs> or a yell or something. And so I got up and went in there. I thought he hurt himself. And what it was, it was like 20 or 30 American cockroaches boiled out of the sewer when he moved the, uh, the toilet out of the way. So um, if, if you're having an American cockroach issue uh, at a house or in a commercial building, you want to start checking uh, the, the drains, the you know, toilets and stuff like that, because in a lot of cases, that's where they come up. Um, if you have a, a customer that leaves the house for a long period of time, and you know, let's say it's a, a, a winter home or a summer home, uh, a lot of times the toilet will pretty much evaporate and dry out. That's how they gain access. They'll just crawl right out of there and uh, start you know, roaming the house. So I would recommend in, in those cases, uh, there's a couple things you can do. You can, uh, uh, before they leave the house, they can uh, flush it and then put a, uh, um, uh, an ounce or so of uh, oil, maybe olive oil or you know, some type of cooking oil. And that will uh, uh, cause a, or, or develop a film on top of the water and the evaporation will be less. Uh, so, or I've seen people put cellophane on top as well, and um, you know uh, that will stop the evaporation as well. And if they have uh, people that go there on a regular basis to clean up, or uh, uh, you, the pest control uh, technician, goes there uh, every two months or whatever, uh, you know when you're doing your inspection, uh, you know flush the toilet, uh, put new water in there, and that'll help. Um, you know, keep these roaches from coming up the sewer. Um, also, you can do that on the sink and the tub and, you know, turn it on. And what that does, that uh, fills up the pea trap and, and uh, helps prevent these roaches from coming into the house. So that's just one of the tips I've got for you. Uh, they, they love to be in sewers. Now, I, I mentioned the, um, the ensign wasp a little while ago. And one thing that uh, Dan Suter out of Georgia uh, mentioned once is um, these roaches and other roaches will sometimes uh, get into, especially a smoky brown, will get into tree holes or cavities in trees and, you know, maybe palm trees where the palms come out. And sometimes that holds uh, moisture, but it's definitely a harbage area. Now, what he said, you know, stuck in my mind and I go, man, that is smart. Uh, many technicians will actually apply a liquid inside those tree holes or cavities or palm fronds, you know, where the moisture can collect. And by doing that, you're actually killing 
these predators as well that you know these wasps that prey on you know the egg sacs of these roaches these peridomestic roaches so um, what he recommended and i agree with him is to use a bait of some sort and a granule bait uh, um, you know there's there's several of them out there uh, i uh, you know max force uh, then you have uh, nice's product it's it's a bait uh, even the baits from uh, uh, oh gosh who, who's the other one but anyway put a bait in there and what happens is, is that the roach will feed on the bait and, and die, and it will not at all eliminate the, the, the parasites that will actually feed on uh, these roaches and also on the, the egg sac. So that's a good tip there. All right, there's a, uh, another photograph there uh, of a, uh, it actually shows the pronotum on much better. And now you notice the, the, uh, the dark area here on the pernotum. Uh, so, and when I show the other roaches, you will see uh, the difference real quick. That's the male. Now, back here in the back, you'll notice that it, there's a, a couple of spike looking things and that's the styli. That, that's how you, you can tell the uh, male from the female that you have two of these back in the back right there. So there's your uh, male American cockroach. Uh, they go by several names, and you probably have heard all of them. You know, uh, uh, American cockroach, water bug, Bam Bombay canary, palmetto bug. You know, just names you probably have heard people say say out there. Um, they were introduced in North America back in the 1600s uh, on ships from Africa, and now they're all over the place. They're they're all over the continent and in many other uh, countries as well. They're probably the largest, uh, one of the largest anyway, getting about two inches long. And um, uh, they can <laughs> scare the bejesus out of uh, homeowners sometimes. They would deposit, she would deposit her egg, her egg sac in cracks and crevices uh, about four days after it is formed. And there's a photograph of what the Othika looks like there. Um, and she'll produce about 16, in her lifetime, and each one of those contains uh, the, the little uh, areas right here, and there's 16 eggs in this egg sac right here, so give or take a couple. Uh, whew, that's 256 baby cockroaches, nymphs, from one female American cockroach in her lifetime, so uh, that's quite a bit. Speeding up a little bit because I have a lot to cover, and uh, these things will feed on almost anything any decaying uh, matter. They love sweets. They love candies. They'll, they'll, you know, if you leave dishes out uh, in the kitchen, I guarantee it that if there's American cockroaches in the air, they're going to find whatever is left on the, uh, on, on the, uh, in the plates and such if it hasn't been cleaned out. Uh, they'll feed on book bindings, hair, um, dead insects that, you know, they're, they're, they, don't care. They'll feed on anything that's organic. Now, they do travel, like I said, in the sewer systems, so they can be a, a problem, a public health problem, and they are also known to uh, carry somewhere uh, about 22 species of pathogenic human bacteria, uh, which is, um, can be pretty bad, uh, so um, that's something to consider, too, if uh, you have a customer that's on the edge of not, not on the edge, but they don't know if they want their your service or not you can tell them about you know the uh, how they can carry up to 22 species of uh, bacteria and patho pathogens uh uh like most cockroaches they 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 spend their time you know hiding uh, in cracks and crevices and, and a lot of times they'll come out uh, at night so um, you don't you don't see them during the night daytime too often but at nighttime, they get out and start crawling around. So, and they will go to lights um, and out foraging around to uh, find some food. Okay, this one here is the Australian cockroach. You can tell it by the bat emblem on the back. It's much more pronounced. Now, this roach likes to be high. I have found this, these roaches in attics. Uh, matter of fact, I was doing a, a termite inspection once and I, I heard this rustling above my head 
And when I looked up, there were just hundreds of Australian cockroaches crawling around up there. Uh, I found termites. So when we fumigated, we pretty much knocked these out. They were no more. So that's the female Australian cockroach. And this is the brown cockroach. And notice the difference here. Uh, you can barely see the bat emblem. Now, this roach isn't as common as the other ones that we have talked about. Um, I see them on occasion, but uh, it's just an, another roach that you might find uh, on occasion, especially down here in the southeast around Florida and probably Alabama, Georgia. Um, not, not very common, uh, you know, throughout the United States. And you would treat these just like you would um, the American cockroach as well. Oh, and by the way, it's a male. You can see the uh, Cersei back here in the back if you look. Hope my mouse is showing that. Okay, now shifting gears again. This is one of those that are extremely hard to control sometimes, and they're, they're mainly found um, north of Florida. I have never seen the Oriental cockroach in Florida, ever. So, um, because they, they want temperatures uh, down below 84, 85 degrees. Uh, they require a lot of moisture. So you find them a lot in cellars around uh, your uh, sump pumps and any air conditioner, uh, you know, uh, air handlers and stuff that sometimes have water in it. So um, yeah, they, they, they require a lot of, uh, of moisture. They can be hard to control sometimes because when you apply around the perimeter with a liquid uh, a, a application, um, you know, as that starts to die, uh, these things reproduce so quickly that uh, you start having uh, new ones appear and nothing there to stop them. So uh, it's, uh, they can be very difficult. This is a male. You can tell the male. And by the way, the male has a, a short wings uh, compared to almost no wings. Well, I guess that would be no wings in the female right here. So that's your oriental cockroach, your male. And um, you can see the styli right here on the male. It's pretty pronounced right there. So if you guys are having to control these things, you want to uh, look in areas of that have, um, you know, more moisture than normal. Uh, you can use baits, you can use liquids. Um, you know, just something to keep them from entering. Um, you, you have to think like this bug. And uh, I highly recommend that you, um, you read up on them. Uh, this is something that I have never had to uh, treat before. I uh, just know their biology and such. And uh, so it, it, it'll do you good to learn as much as you possibly can on this, on this roach. Now, this one here, looks a little like that one, but it's not. That is what we call the smoky brown cockroach. They're all through Florida, up into Georgia, Alabama. Uh, I'm not sure how far west they go. Um, you guys may not have ever seen these before, but these roaches like to be up high. Around my, my place here at the farm, on occasion, I'll see them outside near the fascia board, uh, the soffit area. I'll see them up in the trees. That's where I normally see them. And so these are the ones that love to get into tree holes, uh, cavities and such as that. And that's when I would apply a bait of some sort in there to uh, attract them and feed them and not kill uh, the, the wasp that parasitize their egg sacs. So um, liquids do pretty good. Um, if you apply your liquids well, if you're gonna apply a synthetic pyrethroid, you want to make sure that you put that product, for instance, if you have a fascia, force your product up where the fascia and the exterior wall meet. Get that product up in that crack and crevice. Uh, it's very important because that's where these roaches are going to go, and that's where they're going to uh, set and rest as well. If you just do a willy-nilly um, uh, fan spray on the fascia, um, that, that product's going to break down. Uh, the roach is just going to crawl right over it. Uh, not spend any time on it. So, you know, force your products under the window seal into cracks and crevices where you know that these roaches are going and not just do a circle around a, wind, a window. I've watched so many technicians just go and, and spray a circle around the window, which, you know, after a week or so that that product is, is pretty much starting to uh, 
go away because of the weather, the sunlight, and things such as that. There's a uh, another male. Actually, that's the female there. And here's the male. And if you look, you'll see the, the Circe back here as well. These, uh, like I said, they're up high. So you want to check uh, trees, palm trees, oak trees, uh, things like that. Look for harborage areas and get rid of them. So I think, let me see. What, yeah, I think that's, yep. There's your other one there. Ed, are you popping back in or do they know what to do? Yeah, no, I uh, froze up there for a second. <laughs> I hear you. Sorry about that. So, uh, okay, everybody's doing a great job of typing the codes in. Uh, some of you are asking about um, credits in certain states. Uh, sometimes we don't get credits in a state because we submit it and they send it to us later or they just don't approve it in time. Um, so uh, Macedonia, uh, North Carolina, I'll let you know. We submitted that a month ago and I will stay in touch with you one on one on that. OK. Other than that, uh, go ahead, Dan, you can uh, take it back over. Looks like Sam popped in. Yeah, one quick reminder for everybody. Um, we are answering questions in the chat and saving our favorites for uh, Daniel at the end here, if time allows. So uh, please don't be afraid to throw some questions in the Q&A. All right, hand it back over to you, Daniel. All righty, thanks a lot. Excellent. I hope you guys are uh, taking this in and learning something. Uh, it's, um, you know, when I, when I teach this stuff, I, I sometimes wish I had a couple hours uh, because there's so much to cover and we have to kind of condense it. Uh, and uh, so it all fits into the time allowed by, by the state. So hopefully, or your state or my state or whatever. So hopefully I'm, I'm not going too fast and covering everything that I need to. Now, I'm uh, getting to the end of the, uh, the roach thing here, but uh, this cockroach right here, um, you can find in the Gulf states, Florida, Southern Alabama, maybe up into Georgia, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and in parts of Texas. And uh, it's not really uh, something I would call a, uh, a roach that infests homes, but on occasion they will show up, uh, especially in the fall, in October, November, uh, they'll fly around lights and stuff like that. And the reason why I, I actually chose to put this in here, the uh, Cuban cockroach is because they breed uh, or have, well, let me just show you. Notice this. Uh, do, do you see an egg sac in there anywhere at all in Othika? Well, this is one of two roaches that we see on occasion that has a live birth. It, it actually retains the Othika inside. And when it's time to uh, uh, have babies, they, they just crawl out of the, uh, the abdomen of the uh, of the mom here. Uh, the other one is the Suriname roach. And uh, uh, in the case of the Suriname, there's actually no males. They, they just kind of do their thing there. And so there were 22, 21, 22 babies here, nymphs that crawled out of this, this roach. Now, how I got this is that uh, it was one night I'm watching television and I see this thing flying around my light. And so uh, with my lightning fast reflexes, I grabbed it out of the air <laughs> and I put it in this, this uh, specimen jar and took it to the office. And uh, uh, when I came back the next morning, sure enough, look at that. We, we got a bunch of baby roaches. So uh, not all roaches actually, as far as these two, anyway, the uh, Cuban and Suriname uh, will actually deposit deposit an egg sac and i'm sure there's some other roaches out there as well that um, uh, that may uh, have live birth like this but i'm just not aware of them so if you see this roach it's kind of neat looking it's solid green looks the coloring of a uh, green tree frog actually um, not normally an issue I, I wouldn't worry about trying to treat because they're uh, what i would call an occasional invader and usually just a couple uh, you might see, uh, and they won't infest the house. So, 
I'm putting this here more mainly as a point of interest. All right. Now, uh, years ago, my the owner of Florida Pest Control came to me one time, the uh, uh, Mr. Sapp himself, and he was telling me a story of uh, he had a technician that had a matchbox. And this is years and years ago. You know, uh, Florida Pest Control is, is well over 70 years old. And so this is a long time ago. And he goes, he tells me a story about the guy comes into his office and says, Mr. Sapp, I've got something I've never seen before. And you probably haven't either. It's an albino cockroach. And so uh, he goes, well, I want to see it. And so when he opened it up, guess what? It, the pigmentation had already uh, <laughs> come back. And it was a, in a, a dark nymph American cockroach. And that's what you're looking at here. This is an American cockroach that has molted um, fairly recent. And you can start seeing the, uh, the pigments starting to come up. So if you ever see a roach that's white like this, all it is is that it's pulled itself out of the old skin. It's going into another instar. And that's what they call it, the, 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 the phases of the nymphs, instars. And I think there's five in stars before uh, the adult. So uh, if you see that, that's all it is. Uh, there's a close up of it right there. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting hoarse here. And that's what it would look like after it gets darker. And so that is a uh, um, probably fourth in star uh, American cockroach. So. All right, let's uh, shift gears and uh, talk about the incredible, lovable silverfish. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the uh, things that uh, I've had experience with and some good, some bad. So let's talk about this thing. Uh, there's just a picture of one and there's a picture of another one. There's also things out there called fire brats and um, uh, bristle tails. They're, they're, you know, pretty much uh, similar, uh, just the habitat is uh, a little different. So, well, <laughs> maybe not so lovable, but definitely incredible, I'm thinking. Uh, now, these things date back four million years ago. They one of the most prim primitive animals on Earth. Um, they can live up to six years. And one thing about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, silverfish is they never stop growing, uh, they molt, and they're similar to a snake. Uh, if a snake is feeding regularly, uh, it'll, it'll shed multiple times. And the same thing with, with these, they just, uh, they just molt and molt and molt, and finally they just die. Uh, they never get too long, maybe an you know, inch, if, if that long at all. Uh, they can live up to 12 months without feeding as long as they have water. So they can be extremely difficult to control sometimes because they're, they're long lived. Now that they feed on almost anything, you have book bindings, hair, clothing, carpet, glue, coffee, sugar, paper, leather, cereals, dandruff. And uh, <laughs> that's just a small list. Let's see, uh, did I add to that list? No, anyway, they will feed on their own skin too, their exoskeleton once uh, they have molted. And they'll also feed on dead insects. So um, uh, plenty for them to eat. So uh, trying to starve them out probably will not work. Um, uh, one thing that I have noticed in my uh, experience is that they, sometimes the infestation are localized. Uh, you, you find them in a bathroom or they, you find them in the master bedroom or you find them in a, uh, the basement or something like that. And sometimes they, uh, they're just in one area. At my house, uh, the main area that I used to find them is the, uh, the master bath. Uh-oh, I hear somebody pop in there. Anyway, anyway, the uh, I found them in the, the master bathroom. Uh, now, finding the source is, is the key. You, you want to uh, try to locate where their main source is. And that can be difficult at times, but it can happen. Um, sometimes removing the uh, food source will help uh, eliminate the moisture, you know, uh, exclusion may help, uh, you know, uh, sealing up cracks and crevices and stuff like that. I'm a proponent about uh, exclusion uh, when it comes to uh, keeping things from coming in from the outside. And you can do that with, uh, well, to control pests as well by uh, stopping and eliminating uh, places like plumbing, 
um, you know, where cables come through, all of that can be sealed up. Uh, if the infestation is large, you, you want to turn your attention to the outside, um, believe it or not. A, a lot of times they might be in firewood or something that's up against the house because these things naturally occur outside, but they will infest inside and they do. Uh, you know, warehouses, sometimes you, you bring them in boxes and stuff like that. But on occasion, the infestation may be coming from the outside. So you want to look for, you know, wood piles, firewood, stuff like that, that's, you know, stacked up against the house. Uh, now, there's some tools that you can use to, uh, to, to track these things down. Um, small glue boards, something like that. Uh, let me see, do I get into this? I uh, oh yeah, you know, what you would do is um, your glue boards, you want to date and number them. And, and then on a piece of paper, you know, put where you uh, uh, note where you place these things. And um, so you place these things in several areas and uh, of the area that's they're most seen. And the one that has the most silverfish in it is the winner. And somewhere near that placement is probably the uh the epicenter that that's that's where uh you you start your inspection work out from there and a lot of times you will find it, it it's similar to uh how you would uh try to track down a for instance a fruit fly infestation using fruit fly traps and things such as that uh the the one that has the most is the winner and you start from that point so I've said all this already. You want to make sure you look, you, you log it. If you go back a week, right? Uh, number five had 15 and number six had one and so on and so on. So log all this, you know, have a paper trail. And then uh, you want to schedule your return trips and uh, inspect and look for them. Um, the one with the highest number, like I said, is the, uh, the winner. Uh, real quick story. I had a technician that was having a silverfish issue in a master bathroom. He couldn't figure out why they tore it apart. They looked in everything. And finally, the customer says, um, if you don't solve this problem, I'm gonna find somebody who can. Now, guys, don't let this get to that point. If you can't solve a problem after two visits, then bring in some help, you know, bring in another technician, supervisor or whatever the case you can um, because another pair of eyes is important. So, so he, he got a hold of me, we scheduled it, went out there. I did the inspection. I asked what he has done and he told me and everything was done properly. But one thing he, he overlooked, it, it was a slab home. I said, let's go up in the attic. I said, grab uh, uh, two bags, you know, garbage bags. Uh, put your gloves on and uh, let's go up in the attic with you and a B&G. I forget what product we used. So we went up there, we went towards the bathroom. And when I got near the bathroom, you know, they had their fan and then they had their duct work and there was a dead possum. It had been up there for years. It had mama, you know, turned into a mummy. All that's there is the bones and hardened carcass and hair. So I hit it with my inspection tool and the silverfish came boiling out. So that's why I told him to bring the, uh, the bag and his gloves. So I said, reach in there and pull all that inside the bag just to clean this up. And then I said, treat the area. And that solved the problem. You know, all we did was, you know, get out of the, you know, get out of the box, look in different areas. So uh, uh, you, you got to think so, like a silverfish. You want to know their, their, their habits and their, you know, their biology and all that kind of stuff, uh, similar to what I said earlier. So, uh, you know, make sure that you take the time to learn about the pest you're dealing with. Uh, and that's pretty much my message today is not just, uh, you know, going out there and applying your product in the, in the proper places, but figure out why you're applying those products there and the and, and only way you're gonna do that is to learn the bug you're dealing with. There's no doubt about it. So uh, I think that's it for me. I think we're on time too. Well, maybe a little bit over. So that's it. All right, that was excellent. Appreciate it, Daniel. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.
All right, Ed, do you want to uh, give a couple details on CEUs and the uh, quiz? Yeah, let me go ahead and put the quiz link into the chat right now. Hopefully you guys can see that. Sam, you see it, right? I do. Perfect. Okay, so if everybody can go ahead and click on that Survey Monkey link, it'll only take about three or four minutes. And then, um, and, and then while we're doing that, uh, Sam, I guess if you're going to do Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just so everyone knows, as long as uh, you were here for the class, entered your code words, and you take that quiz, you'll be good on your CEUs. Um, no pressure to stick around, but uh, if you'd like to, we are going to spend a few minutes here on Q&A with Daniel. All right. So we did get a handful of questions here, Daniel. Um, so one question on Turkestan roaches. Now, I don't believe I ever encountered Turkestan roaches down south, but I do remember a bit from Indiana. Have you uh, had much experience with Turkestans, Daniel? I, I have not. I have seen them, and I, I may have some photos of them. But yeah, uh, they are popping up, especially in apartment dwellings, uh, mainly because of uh, pet owners that have pet lizards and things that actually feed on them. So the pet trade is the reason. <laughs> and uh, so these things escape, and next thing you know, they're, they're breeding in these uh, apartments and such as that. Uh, uh, as far as treatment is concerned, the people that I have talked to, uh, they, they pretty much, uh, you, you treat it like any, uh, any, any roach. Uh, baits will work, some liquids will work. Uh, try to figure out why they're there and how they got there and, and take it from there. Uh, I wish I had more experience with them though. No, I, I think I had a similar experience, Daniel, uh, you know, exclusion, sort of handling how you would any sort of paradomestic cockroach, I think, uh, yes. works well there. Uh, so got another question on, um, what about dust for treatments of roaches, um, like diatomaceous earth or others? Well, you know, dust has its place. Uh, un unfortunately, a lot of times the dust isn't applied properly. And they actually put it uh, put it out too much, too thick, and um, at that point it's avoided. Uh, so any of the dust that's out there, the insecticidal dust, and, and include it, including diatomaceous earth, should be lightly applied, and in areas where uh, you know the customer uh, will not see it or come in contact with it, uh, wall voids, you know things like that. I have no problem with dust at all. If, it, if it's applied properly, and, and that's what normally does not happen. <laughs> it's usually applied way too thick. Uh, it, it's called a dust for a reason, and it's dust. It's thin. It's, you don't even notice that it's there. So, uh, and there's a lot of good dust products out there. No doubt about that. Just apply it properly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that may be why you don't see dust used quite as much anymore is because it, it is tough to get folks to apply them uh, as a dusting, right? And not uh, oh, yeah. small piles. Uh, so next question here was um, on insect growth regulators, IGRs. Um, do you have any thoughts on IGRs for control of the pests we talked about today? Once again, they have their place as well. Uh, I personally never used them. Uh, I, you know, I just haven't. Uh, I found out that if, if your products are applied properly in the proper places um, and you, your, your frequent uh, see of, of, of going back uh, is, is there. In other words, you don't wait three months or whatever the case may be, you can control them. But, you know, having said that, uh, uh, sometimes these IGRs do work well, especially when it comes to um, uh, the female German cockroach. Uh, it, it just, uh, a lot it does something to her and, and it sometimes forces her to go ahead and feed then of, of course we know what happens that once uh, uh, a roach comes in contact with it, it wings are deformed they can't uh, uh, you know molt to the next stage there's all kinds of stuff that happens but I, I just never I'm a minimalist when it comes to that type stuff so uh, it, it, it's up to the technician you know if, if they feel that they need to use it, once again, use it properly, according to label, 
And by all means, don't waste your time with bed bugs with IGRs. That's all I got to say about IGRs. How's that sound? <laughs> I think that is solid, Daniel. And that uh, reminds me of what I used to say about them uh, when I would do some talks on road mm -hmm. control. Uh, so the last question here, unless uh, one pops up, is how long do roaches live? <laughs> you know, I was just reading that uh, there's... Uh, uh, there's, it's mixed. It depends on the species, but you can get several years out of an American cockroach. I don't remember the uh, exact number, but uh, you have to think about, you know, where they're at. Uh, so <laughs> if, if there's no predators out there whatsoever, uh, they can live a year, maybe more. Uh, but uh, on average, it depends on the species. I, I really don't have a solid answer on that one. Yeah, I think, uh, you're about spot on, as far as I can recall, on, on roaches. I think uh, German cockroaches, you typically see uh, a couple hundred days. I always thought an interesting thing about German cockroaches is if they, you have good conditions for them, you know, hot, humid, etc. Yeah. They actually go through their life cycle faster, and you end up with dead roaches sooner, just uh, with lots of baby roaches left behind. Yeah, they burn themselves out if, if the... <laughs> If the, uh, the, the, the environment is perfect for them, you know, plenty of food, plenty of that, you know, they're, they're going to die. But uh, that's where we come in. We, we try to uh, eliminate their lifespan, uh, you know, shorten it quite a bit. How's that sound? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that was indeed the last question. Uh, and I think uh, we're starting to see folks uh, trickle out now. But uh, that was an excellent webinar, Daniel. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as all of us did. Uh, for those folks on the line, we will uh, you know, be available via email, either at the True Champions inbox um, or any of the folks here's personal emails. Uh, and the recording of the webinar should be posted in the next.